Good morning. morning. Well, it's, I'll tell you what, it's nice to be free in Christ. Amen? Amen. Grace Bible Fellowship, we just go through the Bible line at a time because we believe that all scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for doctrine, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness so that the person of God might be complete and not lacking in anything. So because we believe that, we go through the scriptures line at a time, and then there are times like today (laughs) when I have to get hooked on phonics (laughs) and read a giant list of names. So we have an entire chapter of names. So you get to laugh at Pastor Dave. (laughs) And I will be taking certain liberties and I will be skipping, um, not because I have a jump rope, but I will be skipping some sections, but we will be getting the essence of it. But because we have a reverence for God's word, uh, try not to mock me too much. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a tremendous privilege it is to be able to be here, to be called by your name, to be saved by your blood to be sealed by your spirit. Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you for your word preserved well over the years. I pray as we we open it up, Lord, and we look at it and we want to know the understanding of it, the tense of it and the meaning of it, I pray that you might speak to each one of our hearts. You know our concerns and our cares. You know our troubles, our families, our friends. And Lord, you are the one who brings comfort. You are our strong tower that we run into and are safe. You are the one in whom we can trust because all of your promises are yes and amen. So Lord, we lift our eyes to you. We lift our hearts to you and pray that you might move in every heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're in chapter 36 of Genesis. And if you've read on ahead... Uh, You probably know how to pronounce these names a little better than I do. Uh, And we're just going to give it a shot. Basically, we're looking at the family line of Esau. You guys remember Esau, the man of flesh, the man who sold his birthright for a bowl of red lentil soup. So that's who Esau is. And over the years, he, as well as his brother Jacob, in their being apart from each other, have mellowed. And they've come back together and made peace but we're going to look at his family and what happens and where they settle. So last week, we were in chapter 35, where God reminds Jacob, after decimating Shechem and killing every male that's in that city, that you got to get out of here. And he says, you, you, you were supposed to go to Bethel anyway, so uh, by the way, that's where you're supposed to be and tells him, go to Bethel where I first met you. And it's a good idea if you've gotten off track and you've gotten into a a place where you're not calling on God and God isn't a real part of your life. You don't have that fellowship, that reality of God speaking to you and walking with you. It's a good idea to go back to, to figure out where it was you left him. Because he doesn't really get left. It's us who gets left. We leave him and he doesn't leave us. So he tells him to go back to Bethel, and he does, and he he goes back, and now suddenly we're going to have this resurgence of spirituality in his life. The previous chapter, God was not mentioned at all. There was no prayer. There was nobody calling out to God. There was, God was not involved in any of those decisions. It was all a decision of flesh where Dinah uh, ends up being, unfortunately, uh, the end of sexual Uh, abuse, and suddenly the brothers take over and rule over the father and decide we're going to kill everybody, and they use a religious ploy to make it happen, uh, which is detestable. And yet at the end of the chapter, we're asked, "Is is it right to treat her like a prostitute and just let this thing go unchecked and for justice to go by? And so he goes back to Bethel, and before he does that, he gathers all of the idols that the people have. Apparently, it was okay for them to have them up to this point. 
Uh, so you see kind of a passivity where he allows these idols to exist in his family with his people. And he says, get them all out now. And they bury it underneath the tree. Uh, the tree, whenever the scripture speaks of a tree, I always think of the cross. And that's where we bury our idols too, right? At the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Okay. You guys remember this last week? So he goes out and strangely enough, all of his fears are completely unfounded because none of the people around the area are after him. None of them are going to go after him. And even the Lord causes his enemies to live at peace with him, as the scripture says. And so um, I remember Psalm 32, where David says, don't be like a horse or like a mule that has no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle, else they will not come near you. You don't want to be somebody where God has to direct you with a stick from behind, as opposed to leading you with his voice from in front. Um, that's the way sheep are led, but sometimes they have to be driven and sometimes their legs need to be broken and carried around for a while. Uh, don't choose to be one of those. And so he goes back and he's back, at, he's back there and we understand that there's another death that occurs. Uh, one of the nurses uh, who may have raised him dies. He buries her under trees. So there's a lot of things under trees in Jerusalem uh, in that area. And then the Lord reminds him of something that he needs to live up to. If you remember, the Lord met with him and he says, you will no longer be Jacob, which means heel catcher, supplanter, schemer, deceiver. Your name will be Israel. And so he reminds him again, your name is Israel, which means governed by God. How many of you can identify with that name? Governed by God. When we give our lives to the Lord, when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and we give him our lives, we realize we're his creation. We are governed by God. So Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do with my life. And I lay myself down. That's what baptism's all about. It's this picture of death where you go down into the water. And, and if we left you there, that's what, that, that's what you'd be. <laughs> and then there's the bringing up out of the water which is a symbol of the resurrection. And so we identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also the death of our flesh, our willfulness, our own self-drivenness. And so he's reminded, your name is Israel. So you want to live up to that. You don't want to be Jacob anymore. And it's interesting because it doesn't really stick as you look through. You'll see some glimmers of when he does some right things and he's called Israel, governed by God because he's doing the right things, but mostly he's just Jacob. Live up to your new name. Jesus reminds us, if you remember on the, road to Dema um, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus reminds the disciples of everything in the scriptures pertaining to himself, and they didn't even know it was him. It's interesting. Sometimes the Lord speaks to us and we don't realize it's him. But he's reminding them of all the things that they should already remember. Very often, God just reminds us and gives us a new application of old information. Uh, some of us want new information. Ooh, ooh, I want new information. Well, when you live up to all the information you already know, maybe the Lord will give you something more. But it, most of us need to be reminded of those things that the Lord has already spoken. And then we looked at the death of Rachel. As they were on their way back home, Rachel being pregnant with her last child dies and they name actually all of the children's names were named by women. And so as she's dying, she names this son that she's giving birth to Benami, which is son of my pain. And so very soon after she passes her father or his father decides to change his name to Benjamin, which is similar but it means son of my right hand instead of son of my pain. And it's the only child he gets to name. I didn't mention that last week. He sneaks it in because I guess he could. And just to make soap operas even more interesting, you have Reuben, who's the oldest, who decides he's going to sleep with his stepmother. And he has carnal relations with his stepmother. And it's interesting that Jacob finds out about it but he does nothing. He finds out about it, but he doesn't confront. And I wouldn't know exactly what to do 
or, or who to be angry at or who to kill or it would be a mixed bag for me as well. But it's, it's interesting how he just lets it go until chapter 49 where later on he pronounces a curse on him and he's supposed to be the oldest and the oldest always has the pressure to know better and kind of run things and watch out for all the youngers. Well, he kind of blows it here and the blessing doesn't go to him. It actually uh, goes down in the person we're going to be talking about as we go forward. And so we're introduced to all of his sons, all 12 of them. And this is, these are the children of Israel. And so we know who they are. And we see that finally Isaac dies. So Isaac dies uh, 43 years after his last meal. Remember, he told Esau, Esau, go out and get me some of that good food that I like so I can give you the blessing and then I can die. Okay, well, it was 43 years later and he finally dies. So his last meal was 43 years ago. Um, and so he's buried in the tomb of the patriarchs, which I have pictured here on the right-hand side. And so in this chapter, there are these three deaths of, of Deborah, Rachel, and Isaac. And yet there's a revival coming with Jacob. There's something new in his heart. He wants to do things God's way. He's buried all of the idols of his family at the foot of this tree. He got out of Dodge and he's headed to uh, where the Lord called on him in, originally. And so this week, we're going to look at the, f the families of Esau, and then we're going to talk about the families of Jacob as it rolls on from there. Beginning in verse 1. Now, this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Uh, you guys know Esau was called Esau because it's very similar to the word red, which is Edom. Edom is a land that has lots of red dirt. And if you remember when he sold his birthright, he sold it for some red stew. So red is his color. And so just so that you understand, when they mention Edom, Edom is a land, but Edom is also the people of Esau. So not to be confused. Esau and Edom are the same. Genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. You remember he was told not to do that. In fact, that's why uh, J um, Jacob got sent away. Ada, the daughter of Elon, not Elon Musk, Elon the Hittite. Aholabama. Now there's a good girl name right there. Aholabama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the, Hit, the Hivite, and base math, which I don't know what kind of math that is. <laughs> Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Now, Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, and base math bore Reuel, and Aholabama bore Jeush, Jaalam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle and all his animals and all of his goods in which he had gained in the land of Canaan. And he went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. Remember, they gathered for the funeral. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. That sounds very familiar, like what happened with Lot. And the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. In case you didn't get it in the beginning, Esau is Edom essentially. So all of the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. So as you, as you see that later on in time, the name changes from Edomites to Edomians. The last Edomian which is mentioned in scripture is Herod the Great. And then all of the descendants of Esau have either uh, been absorbed by other peoples or they've been wiped off the face of the earth. They were always a perennial enemy of Israel, always. So as, they, as we look at all of these wonderful names that I have to pronounce in front for you, He's got three wives. You remember he met, he met and married two. I guess he got a, they were on sale or something. But he got two wives in Canaan. 
and he wasn't supposed to marry any of the people, and it frustrated his parents to no end. And so he went and found another one. Uh, this one was a descendant of Ishmael, actually. So uh, still related to Abraham, but not, uh, still not any better than the ones he married previously. And they settled in a place called Mount Seir. I don't know if any, any of you know where Mount Seir is, but uh, that's where the rock city of Petra is uh, in Mount Seir. So if you're familiar with that, if you, if you saw um, uh, Indiana Jones, one of the Indiana Jones, they actually feature it. Dum, da, dum, dum. Never mind. <laughs> and this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites. So we're going to look at his sons and his grandsons in this passage. And Mount Seir. And these were the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. And Reuel, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. I like Kenaz. Now Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bore Amalek. Now you might recognize that name. The Amalekites come from him. To Eliphaz. And these were the sons of of Ada, Esau's wife. So we're given this great list of people who's related to who and who had who, like this giant family tree. Perhaps if I had the family tree, it'd be helpful. Then I wouldn't have to pronounce them. It's interesting because Eliphaz, the Temanite, is also listed in the book of Job. And it's kind of interesting because you got the first and last name there. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. So it's interesting. He's one of the three friends that comes to comfort Job in all of his affliction and didn't do such a great job. They took a bunch of great, wonderful theology about who God is and then misapplied it, which is so important to have a right application, obviously. And so they said, well, we know that God is just and good and he would never punish the innocent. Therefore, you must have done something wrong, Job. And so they take things they know of God and they misapply it to Job's situation. Uh, have you ever done that? Taken the scriptures and misapplied it to a situation? I've done that. I'll just tell you, I have. Well, anyway, so you'll see Eliphaz actually crosses over. So if there's somebody of importance I'll stop and point it out to you and let you know. Makes you think or check your phone. So if it's Sean, you might be checking your phone right now. See if that's correct. Anyway, so this is, these are the rest of the sons and grandsons, which I shall go all the way down to verse 19. And these were the sons of Esau, who was Edom. And these were their chiefs. And so there's a bit of repeat. And you have these folks of great renown who are called the chiefs or the head of families and their names are known as being leaders in the family of Esau. And I shall relieve you by going to the next slide. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite. Seir is not just a mountain and a place. It's also a guy's name. So it's confusing. But anyway, Seir the Hornite, who, was, who inhabited the land. And now he's got Lotan, Shobol, Zibion, and Anna, and... Dishon, Ezer, and Dishan. Don't get confused between the two. Uh, these were the chiefs of the Horites. So these are the folks who actually lived in that area that Esau moved into. And he intermarried his children with them. And so these people began to get mixed. And that was one way that you could take over property, was actually to move in and have an intermingling and a marrying. Remember a couple chapters ago, that's what uh, Jacob was actually introduced to in Shechem. You know, we'll give you our daughters and you, you, your sons will take our daughters and we'll take your daughters and we'll intermarry. We'll be one big happy family and then we'll own all your stuff. And so it's a way that you, you can take over in the way that it has. Anyway, and these were the chiefs of the Horites according to the chiefs in the land of Seir. And so these were the folks that he intermarried with, but they were kind of enemies really. He's taking over their land. In verse 31. Now these were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned in the children of Israel. So now we're given a list of all these kings. 
this guy died, that, that guy died, and then this guy took over, and this guy died, and I'm just giving you the crib notes. It's going to be a short day today. <laughs> All of these folks, one by one, died, and they eventually, there was the chiefs. All these chiefs, Kanaz, Timon, Mibzar, Magdiel, and the chief of Arim, Aram. Those were the chiefs of Edom, according to the dwelling places in the land in their possession. Esau was the father of the Edomites. In case you didn't get that earlier, Esau is Edom. Edom is Esau. Now, why is this important to be in the word of God? Because we have a little thing called archaeology. And as people are digging these things up and they find things scribbled on, on stone or whatever they have, all of this gets found out that, oh, the Bible is true. Every line of it. It's an amazing thing. They never knew that there was someone called Pilate that was in Jerusalem until they uncovered a piece of stone that has his name on it. And they go, huh, what do you know? There's a guy named Pilate used to be here. Yeah, well, that's what the Bible says. The Bible is accurate, and everything that they have found in archaeology supports it. So when I see stuff like this, that's just God saying, just wait till they dig this stuff up. They're going to they're gonna find it in some, one of the Qumran caves. They're going to dig it up, and guess what? It's all word for word exactly as it happened. And so that's why things like this are in the words, so that you don't get crazy and go, why do we have to read this, Pastor Dave? because I'm unwilling to, apparently. <laughs> Just so that you understand where Edom is, this is the land of Edom, south of the Dead Sea over in here. Here's the rock uh, city of Petra, in case you're wondering uh, where that edifice is, and in case you forget what you were watching on uh, Rages of the Lost Ark or whatever, this is, this is actually it. And there are, there are lots of things like this actually engraved into the, uh, the stone walls in Seir. But you can see where Hebron is, where basically all of this action is happening uh, with the family. And you see where Edom actually left. He went down here and went south. And uh, they built some of these wonderful edifices. And so, let me see. Boy, we got lots of time left over. <laughs> now, see, if it was Super Bowl Sunday, you'd be suspicious, wouldn't you? <laughs> That is the genealogy of Esau. And like I said, they become the Edomites and the uh, Edomian, Edomians, and they actually leave the face of the earth. You can't find one. They're just gone. The peoples are gone. Now, God blessed him in spite of him not being the one who God chose to bless with the ultimate blessing of bring, bringing the Messiah through, but blessed him nonetheless with all of these descendants. In fact, if you remember, the promises given to Abraham and Isaac were that they would have nations come from them and kings come from their body, plural. And it's not just one particular line. It happens to be several lines. So it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. Even with Ishmael, God blessed Ishmael and he ends up having 12 heads just like we see the 12 tribes of Israel. So God blesses people. It's, it's called prevenient grace. Everyone say prevenient grace. Prevenient Good. It's a vocabulary word for the day. It means that God, God reigns on the just and the unjust. He brings rain to, to somebody else's garden who lives next to you just like he brings to yours. In other words, God is good all the time, and he's especially good to everyone in spite of what we deserve. Amen? And even, the, even Esau, who was a man of the flesh, God blessed him, and I imagine never stopped speaking to him to the very end of his days, which I, I find very comforting because there's always a chance to turn around, right? And so I want to thank you for coming today because next week, uh, it took a lot less time. We're going to begin talking about Joseph. Now, any of you who have been through Sunday school know who Joseph is. Uh, not Joseph, the supposed father of Jesus. This is Joseph, the, the descendant of Jacob or Israel. And so from here until the 50th chapter, all the rest of Genesis is about Joseph. And it's all about what happens with him. So tune in and hang tight 
because we're going to start today. So, verse 1 of chapter 37. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding his flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. Ooh, everybody go, ooh. Ooh. Brought a bad report. Okay, Joseph, 17-year-old. He's out there with his brothers, right? Now, these are the, these are the brothers of the, the handmaidens, okay? So they're, they're kind of like feeling a little second-class citizen-ish. You know, they're not Reuben or Simeon or Levi. They're not the, the descendants of Leah. And his other brother, Benjamin, is too young. But he's 17 years old. You know when you're 17. You know everything. Well, it's funny, there's not one negative thing said about Joseph because I believe he's a picture of Jesus Christ. In fact, I'm going to show you 100 ways in which he's just like Jesus Christ and a foreshadowing of him. But I digress. He's learning how to work with these animals and he's out there with his brothers. Now, they're already feeling like second-class citizens and it's interesting because they're on their own. You don't see... Reuben or Levi or Ishkar. You don't see these guys anywhere. It's just these children. So it's kind of like they're divided up. And you remember he had a way of dividing them up. It's a little like when um, Peter Pan shows up with the Lost Boys. You know, you remember Robin Williams and Hook? No, 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 no. Rufio. Yeah, right. Called him skunk hair or something, I thought. Yeah. But anyway, so you got these, it's like they're the Lost Boys. They're like the Forgotten Ones. Not the Lost Boys from 1987. It's a completely different Lost Boys. But more like Peter Pan. Did you know that this movie was based on Peter Pan? Anyway. And so here's Joseph, 17 years old, and he's out there with his, with his half-brothers, and um, he's, he's the youngster among them. And so you know it's not going well for him because he's favored by his dad. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Actually, the wording is, he loved him more than all of his children combined. Wow. Red flag. Favorites, big problem. More than all his children, because he was uh, the son of his old age. Actually, Benjamin was but they were both from the wife that he really negotiated for to marry. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that his father had loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. They could not speak peaceably to him. Gee, I wonder why. That's like being the new guy in the block, showing up at the job and getting paid more than everybody else and expecting them to work with you and not be mad at you. You ever have that happen? Bad news. So there's favoritism. And so dad makes him a coat. It's a coat that everybody takes note that he's loved. I mean, the picture's like, I feel loved. <laughs> because he's got, he's got this. And actually, if you look at the original language, it's not a multicolored coat. I hate to crash your dreams. It's a robe that goes all the way down to your hands and all the way down to your feet. And it's actually multi-widths. And so this is not a coat for working. This is more like the, like the tuxedo of the day, if you will. And so he's, here's a 17-year-old walking around in a tuxedo. And he's the youngest of all of them. And apparently he thinks it's okay to report on his brothers. So what do you think his brothers were doing? Stealing? I don't know. Uh, smoking yak stuff? You know, who knows what they're doing? <laughs> but he reports them, and suddenly he becomes a target. They, so he's kind of like a tattletale. So that, that's how the relationship gets started, and he's already favored 
okay? He's, he, he's up here and they're all down here. And they're already feeling down here because they're not Leah or Rachel's kids. So it's interesting that his coat gets mentioned because in Psalm 22, 18, David wrote of another coat when he says, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Do you remember whose coat that was? That was the outer garment of Jesus, which is made all in one piece. And it's usually made by your mother, which it happened to be. And so they didn't want to tear it into pieces and hand it out and it would become rags. And so that's why you can divide up somebody's clothing, but they cast lots for this one piece. It's interesting how Psalm 22, long before Jesus showed up, said exactly how it would be done. And it seems like two different things. How can those two different things happen at once? They do in Christ. And so there's this coat that's, uh, and, and there's also a jealousy that's going on here. In Mark 15, 10, if you remember, Pilate said this, for he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. You see, the story of Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus who comes and is not accepted by his brothers. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Like it says in the book of John in chapter one. So you're going to notice all of these things and I'll point them out to you as we go along. I'll probably forget a few, but. And so Joseph's amazing technicolor dream coat really wasn't anything that, that Donny Osmond would wear. It's, you know, I don't know. I, you, some of you are old enough to remember when they came out with this. Anyway. So verse five, Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. Can, can I tell you something? If you have a dream, it might be that God's trying to tell you something, not somebody else. If you have a dream, maybe it's for you. And knowing what to share and what not to share, I think shows wisdom. He's 17 years old. He has a dream from God and he's going to share this with his brothers. Red flag. And they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field, like he would do any work. <laughs> then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. He's digging deeper in their displeasure, right? So his dad gets him his coat and then he has this great dream. He goes, oh guys, no, 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 no. Come here, come here. I got to tell you, you got to listen. You got to listen to my dream that I dreamed. I had this dream. That's great. So you're even more special than you were yesterday. Great. So he tells him about the dream. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. There are some times when words should be completely withheld. And there are some things, every heart knows its own sorrow and none can enter into it, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes. There are things that the Lord wants to speak to you about and you suddenly think this is information for everyone else. And it's not. Now, see, I have to separate that stuff every Sunday morning. Like, hey, Lord, what, what of what I'm about to study is for me and what's for them? Because there's stuff for me. And hopefully I can eat that, digest it, put it into my life, and I don't have to tell you all of what that is. But, but I do every once in a while. So forgive me. Oh, let me tell you this dream I had. A fool vents all of his feelings. So I'll, I'll try not to do that. Delusions of grandeur are strong with this one. I'm, I'm sure that's what they were thinking. And he dreamed still another dream. And he told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. This dude's a dreamer. And this time the sun the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers 
And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. It's rather interesting, isn't it? He knew exactly what the dream meant. Nobody knew. Well, what does it mean? Don't know. There's no way of knowing. Let me see. There's 12 sons. There's a father and a mother. He figured it out without any help. And he says, are you saying that your mom and I are going to bow down to you? Like you're going to be in charge of us? Can you imagine a 17-year-old telling you that? I bet you can. <laughs> so glad to have the Fox family here today. So he figures this dream out just like that. He goes, I know exactly what the dream means. I don't need to, uh, to, to figure it out. You mean your mom and I were going to be bowing down to you too? Uh, I think you're having delusions of grandeur. And it's interesting. If you go to the book of Revelation, which is the last book, we're in Genesis, the first book. The last book, the first book helps to define the last book. By the way, everything you find in the book of Revelation is all explained in the Old Testament. So the more you know the Old Testament, the more you'll be able to interpret the new. This is what it says in Revelation chapter 12. Some of you are afraid of Revelation. Look at this. Revelation 12, 1 to 3 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Boy, that sounds familiar. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain and gave birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven diadems on his heads. You go, wow. Now that's a freaky looking thing in my mind, right? The woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon with the 12 stars is Israel. It's the nation, emblematic of the nation of Israel. Because the 12 stars represent the, the 12 tribes of the 12 sons. She's pregnant and gave birth. Israel was pregnant with the Messiah and gave birth to Jesus. Satan tried to come and kill him. And so that's what that's about. If somebody tells you that this is the church, that there's a real problem because the church was always pictured as the virgin bride of Christ. And if the virgin bride's pregnant, there's a problem. Anyway, so it's Israel and we know what that is. And so now you know a little bit of the book of Revelation as well. So you don't have to be so afraid of it. As long as you know the entire Old Testament, it's easy. And so... All his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. It's interesting. So Jacob's like, hmm, I'm going to remember this. And it's funny, when I heard that, it reminded me of somebody else. If you remember, Mary did the same thing when the shepherds came. The shepherds came, and she wasn't sure exactly what all that meant, but it says here in Luke 2.19, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So this is the same essence of what Israel's doing. He's remembering all these things. See, what are you, what are you trying to say? We're going to all bend down, and we're going to, you know, be in deference to you. And All right, I'll keep that in mind. Because he, he loves this kid, right? He's 17 years old, and maybe there's some truth to it. You know, you might, you might have one of your kids come up and say something completely preposterous. And yet there might be some truth in there. So it would do well to remember it, do well to think about it. Just, just like Mary did when the shepherds showed up at, you know, like, uh, hi, I'm sorry, did you get a pass, you know, from the hospital administrator to get in here? And they just showed up and they knew. So she pondered those things in her heart. Next week, guess what we're going to talk about? I don't know why this thing doesn't work. We're going to be looking at the rest of Joseph. We're going to look at the reaction of the brothers. And Joseph's on a, on a course that God has set him on and is sovereignly interposing his will upon this family. 
Joseph is going to be the patriarch of this family. He's the next to the last being born. And yet he's the one that's going to get a double blessing. Ephraim and Manasseh, his children are going to be blessed by God. And uh, we're going to, we're going to see how God works out a really tragic picture of his life and turns it into a wonderful redemption. So uh, stay tuned. 